So good. Well, it's nine o'clock and um, I know we probably need all the time that we need to go through uh, these recommendations and keep making progress uh, for the task force. So um, good morning again. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Riggs with Public Sector Consultants and I want to thank everybody for uh, making it to this meeting this morning to discuss the permitting and design review uh, aspect of the ASDSO recommendations and um, and also in addition to our task force members we're joined by a number of the technical staff from EGLE from the dam safety program um, so they will be available uh, as well during this call and on your other subgroup meetings um, to provide answers uh, in addition to the materials that you already have. Um, so I will uh, do some screen sharing uh, among our uh, materials that we have available to us are the uh, items that were emailed to you earlier this week uh, that give that continuing uh, information about the, the recommendation that you had uh, been discussing at the October 21st meeting. So let me just uh, bring up the uh, agenda for this meeting to refresh ourselves on how we have it laid out. Um, are you able to see the agenda? Okay, great. Um, so this is the permitting and design review subgroup. Uh, we are we have this uh, Zoom webinar reserved until 1030 this morning. Keep in mind that we also have a second subgroup meeting scheduled um, if that is, is needed. So um, I'll be done talking here in a minute and then we can move into uh, the actual work session, uh, which is the majority of, of your time this morning. So we really wanted to make sure that there were some good chunks of time for discussion um, to uh, look at those uh, peer review uh, recommendations a, as a baseline um, for, for uh, the dam safety program review uh, and then uh, determine you know, next steps for those recommendations. Towards the end of the meeting, um, I will uh, pop on again to uh, take a look at any action items that come out of the meeting and just talk about next steps. And then we'll be done at 10.30. Um, are there any questions from task force members or comments? Okay. All right. Um, to do this so I can see all of you. All right. Okay. All right. Well, great. Um, then what I will do right now then is bring up a screen share of um, the recommendations, uh, starting with the permitting aspect of these recommendations. Um, okay, so what you should be seeing on your screen is the uh, a spreadsheet in Excel. Okay, uh, that says permitting in the top box, and it begins with numbers 2020-09-A. And as, as we're having the conversation today, I also will be keeping track of comments um, from the task force members. And I am happy too to just kind of remind us where uh, the conversation left off at, on the 21st as far as um, this group's thoughts on, on the recommendations as they're presented in the peer review report. Um, and this, this really is your meeting, task force members. Um, so, you know, I, I would be happy to uh, go through these top to bottom um, and just review them that way. 
Uh, and if that's acceptable, then we can take a look at this first one and I can just uh, share with you the, the comments that came out of that last meeting. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. I wasn't at the last meeting, Elizabeth, so that would be helpful. Oh, great. Thank you, Marty. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing I just wanted to mention um, about this uh, table that you're looking at is that uh, this represents uh, quite a bit of work that was done by the Eagle staff to really uh, provide some additional supporting resources for you as you're considering these recommendations. Um, similarly, they've kind of gone through the recommendations that were in the ASDSO peer review report and identified uh, ones that they feel are, from, from the staff's perspective, feel um, either really could use some more task force review uh, or that they feel comfortable with you know, adopting. So I can provide some of that information as well. Okay, so um, that first recommendation uh, in regard to developing a more inclusive list of calculations and documents to be provided by the dam owner. Um, and I guess in terms of timing, I'm not going to read these all aloud. Uh, I trust that you've seen this already. And I know some of the comments we got back from the previous meeting suggested that we not take the time to, to read through all of these. So this first recommendation, um, the staff identified uh, a rule change associated with uh, implementing this action and also provided some existing, uh, the link to the administrative code. Um, they've also looked at this column here, the last column about what kind of additional staffing and resource capacity would be needed um, in order to implement that. The last thing I will just say is that at the meeting on the 21st, some of the questions that came out of this group were wondering what kind of projects would this recommendation apply to? Would it apply to uh, existing projects or just new ones? So this is Luke. Um, <clears throat> I think that this would be for any application that we receive, you know, for for um, dam safety. So it'd be construction of a dam, removal of a dam, rehabilitation of a dam, or you know, repair of a dam. So I think it'd be, um, you know, kind of everything. Everything, every uh, permit application that we have that has a dam safety component would have kind of a standard list of documents and stuff that that uh, would have to be provided by the design consultant. Do you think that that would be the same list for every one of those, or would you guys have to kind of come up with something that would be specific to a, a new dam or repair or, or whatnot? So that's why I think I included the list of uh, or, or the link to the the uh, Part Three Hundred and Fifteen Administrative Rules. <clears throat> Excuse me, because it's it's kind of defined in there by the type of activity. So if it's construction of a new dam it's a different list than repair of a dam because you don't, when construction of a dam, we're also worried about all the environmental impacts that come with constructing that dam, where if it's repair of repair or maintenance of an existing dam, those impacts have already happened at the, at the date the dam was constructed. So we don't look at that as that. So I think it would have to be kind of a one size fits most type of thing. If it's this type, it goes into this bucket and these are the typical documents. And uh, so if you, if, you, if you get some time to look through those rules, there's also kind of the broad statements that say any other documents that the, the department de seem, determines that to be necessary. But I think it would be helpful for this recommendation to have more of a standard list of all kind of a, a more defined standard list that says you must provide your geotechnical, you know, can, uh, ca ca uh, you know, calculations, your, your hydraulic calculations, all these things kind of list those out so that the people know exactly what they have to, to, to do to design a safe dam, so. Well, I, I would think um, it needs 
a, a, a clause in there as applicable, right? Yep. You know, I mean, obviously, if you're putting in a brand new gate or something and uh, with a brand new design, then you're going to just be focusing on structural sort of calculations. You're not going to get into the geotechnical stuff in that case. Um, yep. You know, there's a pretty broad list there, I think, of things we could come up with. Yep. Do, do you think it would be helpful if Elizabeth brought up the link and showed us 1305? It might. Yeah, yeah, we can kind of get a feel for what it says. Because uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Paul just said, is we can't define every scenario and tell the folks exactly which documents have to be provided because there's no such thing. So we have to be more general, but I think we can add probably a little more clarity to it than is what currently is in the rules because it's fairly broad in the rules, you know. Um, so do you have it pulled up? Uh, we're still seeing your spreadsheet right now, Elizabeth. Yeah, let me um, do a different share here. Okay. <clears throat> Actually, you know what, let me see if, can I request remote control? Cause it might help. So, I, so I'm not telling you how to scroll. Okay, sure. Let me. Um, I don't know what just happened. I lost your screen when that happened. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to. Uh... You want me to screen okay. share? Them? Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. I see, I see. Yeah. Sorry about that. Here, let me, let me bring this back up. <laughs> All right. Are you able to share your screen? Well, here I, I've just got your yep. screen, so okay. I should. Sure, be I'm going to, to approve. Yeah. All right. All right. So can I? Yeah, Great. I can. I can scroll on your screen now. Okay. So, Perfect. so right here, Rule 13, 1302 is permit applications and procedures. And you'll see that it's it's an application for permit to repair, alter, remove, or abandon a dam, you know, and then it, it kind of delineates an application to construct a new dam, enlarge an existing dam, or reconstruct a failed dam. So there's kind of, you know, it has these buckets of what your typical, you know, and, and then it goes on to say, you know, what documents are required for each one of those, you know, for construction of a new dam, there's these set of documents are required. Um, but you can see it's very general, a site plan, a, a, a location, an existing channel and shoreline, you know, property lines. Uh, and then um, it would say, these typically say things like engineering plans and specifications, but that's about, you know, as deep as it goes until you get down to the engineering plans and specifications section where there's a little bit more definition, but there's those kind of broad statements that, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get there. Project assessment is required, and that has, that's pretty well defined. Um, but right here, engineering plans and specifications. Um, as you'll see, it tells it says what is required, but there's not a whole lot of um, detail about what, what I would call basis of design. You know, it says what you know the engineer must provide by well by way of detailed plans and specifications. And what those plans were, but it doesn't say, you know, what what typically needs to be provided. But it does say these kind of broad statements about uh, yeah, that other item five. that are necessary. You know, things like that. So, yeah, Luke, that item five basically has the other analyses that are necessary to document the adequacy of the design. Um, that that kind of is our catch-all right now. Um, but I, I agree with Paul. I mean, we can, we can go through and provide kind of some general language in regards to what types of analyses, you know, structural and geotechnical analyses, you know, hydraulic analyses would be needed for various types of projects associated with dam construction, rehabilitation, modification, whatever. Um, but it, it's still going to be very, very vague and I, I think there still is going to be some, uh, um, in you know, discussion and interpretation between the reviewer and the designer. Well, maybe. Uh, in, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I speak? Oh, so so Dan, I don't want to jump in too early on this point, but uh, you know, it sort of gives someone uh, 
little bit of heartburn to say inclusive. <laughs> that can mean everything and anything. Um, I just want to give quick, just a quick uh, uh, question, uh, for example, and just a hypothetical. Um, it, uh, when I work with MDOT and we do design of sheet piles, they require that they certify the sheet pile design program. And so you can only use, I think, two programs that are certified under MDOT. Do you, I mean, when I look at the geotechnical design of a dam, uh, you could use finite element, uh, numerous uh, programs that are uh, are not able to show calculations per se because of numerical modeling. Um, what, what do you, are you, am I going way too deep into this or is that a le legitimate concern? No, I think that's a really good question. And I think that that, really kind of dives into the heart of some of these, you know, this item as well as uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the items under design review, um, uh, you know, where, yes, we need to, or it, it's asking what, basically what are our, our standards? Um, I guess Luke, do you, you know, or Amy, do you kind of agree that's the, the question we're really trying to, to answer here? Sorry, say it again, Dan. It, it, kind of like what Stan's getting at, you know, the question really is, you know, what what are what are the accepted design methods? Um, I mean, yes, we, we need to state what analyses they, that, you know, they should do for different types of projects. You know, and there's going to be some discussion associated, you know, relative to specific projects. But, you know, we I think the, the question really is probably what are the specific analyses that we want to see? You know, and what, what are the methods that would be deemed acceptable? Yeah, I think it's a good. Second. Go ahead, Amy. Can I jump in for a second? Because I, I, I have a general comment about these kind of recommendations in the ASDSO report. I think, you know, if the task force supports us making rule changes for these items, we'll need to go through a stakeholder group and come up with what kind of language um, makes the most sense and we'll get feedback and we'll go through the public hearing process and all those things. So I think for me, what's most important from a conceptual standpoint, does the task force think that what we have right now is not sufficient? that it's too general. And then in the recommendation, the task force could say, well, we do think um, this part of the rule needs to be updated, um, maybe even provide some examples of things that we should be adding, but I don't think we need to decide exactly what it's going to say. I think we just need to know, is this something we need to work on in the future? And when we go into rulemaking, what did the task force think about this item? Yep. Go ahead, yeah, Luke. I would, I would agree with that. And I would just, uh, so to, to circle back and answer Dan's question, I think, yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> I think that a lot of these um, recommendations by the task force kind of don't stand alone, right? This is one of those ones that I feel like it doesn't stand alone, but it, it feeds into that larger recommendation that they said that we, sh we, but what I was hearing is that, you know, we should basically uh, memorialize our design and review or our design review process, right? Because we don't have a very formal written down design review process. So it kind of touches on the things that Stan was saying on and what, what Dan was saying is that we want to continue to use industry best practices in design and in design review. You know, so there should be benchmarks for geotechnical analysis. There should be benchmarks for steel sheeting design and things like that. And I'm hesitant to put those into rule because they change and get updated and things like that. But yeah, I, I think Amy is right. We can we can chisel all that stuff out down the road once we decide whether or not this is something we would want to go in and change the rules. Or once you've reviewed the rules to say that's that's adequate and maybe Eagle just has a living document that says, okay, you know, here are the benchmarks we measure geotechnical design against. Here are the benchmarks we measure steel sheet pile design against, you know, et cetera. So I don't know. I don't know the best way to approach it. And I'm hoping that you guys have good ideas, but that's where I would think is like, maybe you don't want to get too descriptive in the rules, make sure that the framework is there, 
and then have some other document that is more of a guidance document for dam owners and, and con design consultants that they can reference and say, these are, these are the, the standards you'll be held to when you're de designing a, a repair, construction, removal, et cetera, for dams. Uh, and here's kind of the process laid out that EGLE follows you know, when they review these types of applications. Well, maybe just um, adding to this language a little bit in section five, other analysis that are necessary to document the adequacy as applicable, including the following, you know, the, the following may be applicable, uh, like spillway capacity, slope stability analysis, flow net seepage, spillway uplift, you know, just some general kind of categories of areas where you might be asking for the, for more information. And I agree, Luke, don't get into the specific standards um, on this, but put a list out there that kind of signals the, the types of things you're looking for, but also leave it open enough to engineer discretion. Obviously, I mean, there's areas that may or may not be applicable and you don't want to force people to go through a bunch of calculations that aren't necessary. Yeah, of course, the, the level of design is always commensurate with the project, right? If it's a simple repair, you don't do a full-blown engineering analysis, but if it is something more like a construction, we need to have all that stuff, you know? So yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, it's something to get towards commensurate with the level of risk of the project and the complexity of the project, you know, something that states that would be a good addition probably. You know, but putting in a list, just a general list like that, I don't think would hurt it, as long as it's, as long as it has the right sort of, uh, you know, ca caveat on it or. I like that idea too, because if we're going to try to sort of update and um, work on our program, we do often get pushback from people about how, how can you require this or how can you require that? So I think some general language in the rule would be helpful. Otherwise, you know, the procedures and guidelines that Luca was talking about, people are going to feel like we don't have the authority to do that. Do you already have documents that this sort of um, language would be included in? Because I, you know, from my frame of reference, when somebody wants to do work on a state highway, they have to come to us for a permit. We essentially tell them they have to follow MDOT specifications and standards. And we have those. We have a bridge design manual, road design manual standard specifications for construction so do you do you guys is this something you guys would have to create or is it something you already have that you would revise we do not have like design manuals you know for dam construction uh, uh one because dams are a little more one-off than roads i think typically but uh um yep. but we do have set we do reference several federal best practices documents you know the core has dam design manuals, the Bureau of Reclamation, and FEMA has gone through and partnered in, in several areas of dam design with, you know, private consultants, dam owners, uh, federal aid, dam safety agencies, and they've developed these kind of all-encompassing kind of the Bible of design, which inclu includes the best elements from everybody, right? And, and they have these, and we refer to those where they exist. Um, and so I don't know if, that's what I said, is I'm hesitant to go ahead and just develop standards because then we would have to be updating those standards all the time as better design practices come out from the agent, from the, from, you know, from the, 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 you know, from the dam design community. Um, but, but I think we can reference those documents, you know, in some type of way that's meaningful that we can get out in front of design call and consult to say, this is the industry best practice this is kind of the benchmark we measure design against and your your design should include these elements type of thing, um, similar to what MDOT has done with their design manuals, but a little less prescribed maybe. That, that makes sense. So um, I'm supportive of this recommendation and uh, we probably should keep in mind that I think uh, like Amy described, our task here is to decide if we're if if we are recommending or or modifying or what. But um, our task is not to change or develop the list today. Uh, 
So in, uh, you know, I took a quick glance at the time and we're coming up on our first half hour. So we might want to um, decide if we are supportive of this recommendation with the understanding that the next steps in the future are to develop uh, the details of this list. Um, I did have one question though for Luke. Um, and that is, uh, if you could help me understand what Eagle uh, envisions as your efforts once you do get all this information from these applicants. Um, I think I, I can't see it on my screen right now, but I think I saw that you're looking for 0.1 F additional FTEs from, from this information. Is, is that, did I see that correctly? I think it's 0.1 FTE in year one to de to develop. Oh, to the, develop the list. The language, you know, that would go into a rule change, or you know, to to to, to develop right. the list of, you know. So I think it'd be, you know, 10% of somebody's time in a year could go to, you know, helping, you know, develop the uh, the uh, rule change language if necessary, or and then looking at this list and you know putting together some type of documentation of. These are the typical design standards that we try to adhere to, but then there are probably, but then I think, you know, there might be some ongoing review and update, but it'd probably be pretty small once the list is developed. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and that guy has a general comment, you know, these are all, <laughs> all contingent that we have the appropriate staffing levels to be able to administer you know, this so, type of program. So yeah, yeah, so Luke, that that was actually the basis of my question is is just having a quick understanding of what you guys will do with all this information once you have it. You know, <clears throat> yeah. are we generally requiring the submission of all this material uh, for documentation and record purposes, you know, that you guys are completing this checklist in your review? Or is there intent, you know, often that FERC does, you know, that they are um, in some instances, performing their own reviews and providing technical comments and, and feedback um, to the to the applicants. You know, it's kind of two different levels of of review, and I'm just curious what um, Eagle uh, intends um, to do with this with this information, and and I'm. I'm just assuming that it would be more along the lines of like ensuring that the applicant is completing all these checklists and that all this information that they have performed all this this work um, in an effort to ensure safe uh, construction and operations. Yeah, I think I think you're right, but I think it's also a little bit of both, right? Because one, it's we have to ensure that the design engineers have done the necessary analysis to produce a safe design. So we have to check all the boxes that say, hey, you know, if you're doing embankment construction, you've done the appropriate geotechnical analyses to ensure that this embankment will be safe. But then we will do a, a level of review of the work too. You know, we're not, we're not going to redesign, you know, anything or, but, but if we see red flags, hey, you know, these assumptions in your analyses don't look correct, or hey, you're, factors of safety are coming out a little bit low based on industry benchmark, then we're going to definitely go back to the consultant with questions that say, hey, you know, why is this not in line with these industry best practices? So, so it's a little bit of both. We, we're, like I said, we're not redesigning projects for design consultants, but we are doing enough of a review to identify any, you know, issues with the design. So uh, just as a final thought, uh, in conclusion to that, uh, the, the FTE projections probably we should maybe consider going beyond just the development of the list, you know, at point one FTE, but by generating this list, uh, there is consequences for FTE demands, you know, as, as all the requested information comes into you guys, you guys have to do something with it. You have to review it, like you say, on some level, process it and, and respond. So, um, well, I, yeah, Glenn, I think I would actually respond. Or my response to that is that, I mean, we actually already ask for all of this information now. Um, the difference is that instead of us having to 
you know, collaborate with the designers and request information and draw that from them. Providing this list up front allows them to go ahead, ideally, and perform all of this work in advance, um, such that it's ready for us to review when they submit the per permit application. So it, it's okay. not that we're asking for anything more in their design than what we already asked. The difference is that we're asking in advance through the rule. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's an important understanding, yeah. Yep. Yep. So I think that you're right, though, Dan or Glenn, is that uh, it might be a little more bookkeeping on the front end, but it should pay off, like Dan said, in the back end, where we don't have to then go back and ask for all this information if it wasn't already provided. So, I mean, and you, you in your, I mean, your experience, you're probably seeing enough that, like, you know, sometimes people do a lot, and sometimes people do a little, and some people require a little more handholding to get to the final destination and some people come in with a really good package on day one. So this would be kind of a level the playing field and, and put it out there. I think <clears throat> this is what we expect. This is what we need. And, you know, please have all that information available when you submit and it would, should be a smoother process so long as we can get people to adhere to it. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you. Yep. This is great discussion. And I wonder if um, to, to Glenn's point, if, uh, the task force members would be ready to um, uh, make a decision about the task force recommendation on this one. Would you feel comfortable um, saying that this is one to adopt um, and then move on to the next yeah, recommendation? Elizabeth, could I have one, just one question quick to Luke? Um, We've talked about checklists quite a bit, and I did find a lot of ambiguity, it seemed, and was looking at both from a, a permitting permitting standpoint, but also from you guys needing to go through and make sure everybody hit the box. Um, I think with Amy and you, Luke, I worked on a project, and there was a natural channel design checklist. That, that might be a, a bad example, but it, it, you, it set the bar of what um, categories and, and what information you needed. When, when we're talking about checklists, do you see something like a, a supplemental document potentially that could be used to standardize the playing field for everyone and for you and for them made the process more streamlined? Sure, sure. And I think, you know, not to belabor the subject, but yeah, I think that checklists are generally a good thing, you know, as far as it helps us review and it, and it helps consultants prepare. So yeah, and I, I think we were working on one for dam removals that, you know, would kind of do that. And I think it would make sense for us to kind of expand that for dam repairs, dam construction, you know, dam. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think it's a great suggestion. I think maybe that's one of the task force suggestions would be go back and look at the rules and see if you guys, if you think we need to change the rules to, to expand more on that. But then also, you know, development of standalone guidelines or checklist type documents for each one of these areas that, because we don't want to put everything in the rules right. and say, refer, you know, just refer back to like, there is a policy or a procedure from Eagle on this. And here's the document that outlines that those guidelines or something like that. So um, yeah, good, 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 good suggestion. Okay. Uh, you know, I support this, uh, this, this section, this, this uh, point here. I guess the only thing that gives me a little pause again is that being an academic is that list of calculations. Can we just say engineering documents? Well, I just think, I think the point we brought up earlier, Stan, is that it's gotta have the due flexibility baked into the language. You know, in some way it has to address that this, this is a list to serve as a guidance to be applied to projects as appropriate. Um, and that just gives the, Luke's bunch more, a little bit more teeth as far as being able to ask for uplift calculations or whatever is needed there. Hey, it's in the list. Now, if it's not applicable, then we move on. So I, I don't know. I just think as long as it's got the due flexibility, we should be covered there. Would would, would you prefer it to say analyses instead of calculations? Yeah, I, it's a minor point. I apologize. I don't want to take the time to <laughs> argue about our word, but I, I it gives me a little bit of heartburn, but uh, as I said, you, numerical methods are not amenable to hand to calculations per se. All right, it's a good point. It's I, a good and, point. And I and I, I just want to throw it. I I'm not sure point one FTE is going to cut it for developing this. If you want to do it in a very 
uh, a detailed manner and that's going to be try to be broad brush to to add the people you have to hold hands to it all the way to the sophisticated uh, FERC design company or company that does FERC projects. Sure, yeah, we could we could make that recommendation too, Elizabeth, maybe consider, uh, you know, 0.25 or a half an FTE in year one, and then it would probably yeah, yeah. tail Something off after like that, this review and, but yeah, so, but I, 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 like Stan, I do like Stan's recommendation, we could soften that language to say what Dan said, like analyses or basis of design, yeah. kind of like broad terms that are all encompassing and then flesh it out more in the list, like Paul said, yep, I like it. Okay, and, and I just, I'm unmuted, right? Okay, um, I am taking notes during the conversation on another screen to track all of this and we're recording um, so that uh, the document that you're looking at right now doesn't get too muddied up, but I just wanted to share that as well. But I will, um, I guess to the extent that this group wants it, I can do some editing on this this table as well. If there's more than one or two changes, it might be better just to copy the recommendation in and make the changes so everybody can, can see it. I think it'll help you in the long run, but this one, it's like changing one word. So I think we're, I think we're good. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amy. And so, um, you know, is it a matter of uh, just changing calculations with, um, what was the preferred term? Analyses. Analyses. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then um, with that edit, uh, so it's like we could then move on to the, the next one here. Great. We tried to take the notes and our notes um, from the last meetings, and I wasn't in this one last time. So um, the where it says same, it means that we thought there was some agreement that the subgroup thought that they would adopt that. And by same, it means the same recommendation as ASDSO. And that's why it's green. But you should definitely double check that everybody also thinks that. I, I, I thought there were some questions on this one. I mean, what are, what, you know, in, in your spreadsheet, you refer to rule changes 310, 311. I mean, those already tell you what you have to do for the different hazard classifications. It seems to me what this what this is, is up in the statute um, that you were, you're asking the dam owner to acknowledge a change in, in potential hazard within X number of days and then change their program accordingly right because when you're when your hazard goes up from from low to significant now you have to do an eap and you have to have you have a different spillway capacity and i think that stuff's already in there though so i guess i'm not sure what this is getting at because it the, the classification again is determined by the state it's not determined by the owner and Paul, uh, to that point, uh, again, just the comments uh, like that that came up from the previous subgroup conversation, questions about clarifying that it is the state that creates a checklist and that requirements include timelines and deadlines for a dam owner. So that was some of what came out of that last conversation. I mean, maybe this belongs in 315 517 the general duty the duties of the owner in the statute where you're just telling them that i guess what 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 in 1310 and 1311 would need to be changed maybe that's the question i think let me see i'm trying to paul but i think this is getting specifically to hazard creep you know um where development downstream of a dam changes the hazard you know the dam was constructed as a low hazard dam, a development happened in the inundation area, now it's a significant or high hazard dam. So I think that that's very lightly touched upon in the permit, or I'm sorry, in the inspection report requirements. 
uh, is 1310, Rule 1310, where it says, you know, the an evaluation of, I forget where it's at, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, sub, sub uh, four recommendations for further detailed studies or investigation, including assessment of adequacy of the current hazard potential classification if appropriate. So I think it's just, I think that what they're saying is give more teeth to that and require that the owner and their consultant take a hard look at things like hazard creep each time the dam is inspected. Um, but yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, I think that's what it's, it's saying, but uh, I could be wrong there. That's the way I interpret it anyway. Um, is so in that, other words, maybe add a little more specificity to to uh, that subparagraph B four there. Um, B4, recommendations yeah. for further detailed studies. The owner shall study aerial maps of downstream of the dam and see who's moved in. <laughs> no, I I think we'd leave it more broad, but maybe. yeah, something to that effect, which is like. Um, uh, you know, add more specificity, but it'd be like, you know, these are the requirements of what you need to look for hazard creep, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, changes in grade or, you know, something like that, that would, <clears throat> you know, okay, cause, yeah. cause the inundation area to have changed if they did a modification to the dam and, you know, now the dam's 10 feet higher and holds back a bigger volume, you know, I'm just thinking uh, it's spitballing, but I'm thinking like, I think that's what they're trying to say. I think that's what this one says is put a finer point on it. What are the things that the dam owner's consultant is required to look at to assess the adequacy of the current hazard potential classification? So I don't okay. know what that looks like, but that's, that's the way I interpreted it. Well, maybe, all right. Well, maybe we just need to clarify that a little bit with, I mean, that, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> I, I guess I, uh, I, I think it could be a big list, but um you know, I, I think directing them more toward that question of hazard creep in that point there uh, would seem appropriate. So, Paul, one one general question that's or comment that's come into my head just now is, I think that the folks who developed these recommendations typically had something in mind or a, uh, a an example that they're thinking about. So. I think that some of these we might be able to get greater clarity if we just go back and ask them, uh, you know, what 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 is what are other states doing and what is a good example of this? And typically ASDSO can come through with things like that. So that's another thing I would just say as a general comment is, you know, we don't one we don't have to flesh it all the details out today. We just have to determine whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And two, I think that rather than reinventing the wheel and trying to pull something together from scratch. We can probably just look at look to the other states around us or the SDSO folks and say, "Hey, what are other people doing to assess hazard potential creep, and you know, on what frequency, and what are they looking at?" Type of thing. So that would just be a general comment, kind of a theme that I'm noticing. So Sorry. look, this is Mario. I just have a comment. So on this one, it seems like you are putting the burden on the dam owner to provide that assessment. Is that correct? Is that the idea? <clears throat> yeah, because so, it should be our our part of our work every time they provide uh, the inspection to reassess the hazard significance. So, potential of the dam. so you and and Paul are both right that we determine the uh, we determine the actual cla hazard classification of the dam based on recommendations and analyses generally provided by the dam owner. So we are not typically doing dam breach analyses. You know, we're not setting up dam break models and determining, you know, mapping out the flood hazard areas. But we can require that of the owner for construction of a dam, or you know, under 315, there's general, you know, general uh, authority to require additional analyses, you know, for the safety to determine the safety and hazard potential of the dam. So I think that, you know, yes, it's right, but it's more of a collaboration because we can look at it and say, hey, there has been a bunch of development since 1980 when the hazard potential classification was assessed and that's an easy one, but then we would take, we would probably push back on the owner and say, you have to provide dam breach analyses that would show whether or not those new development areas are, are impacted because, you know, like Paul said, it's, it's hard to pick that off from a, an aerial map because we can't see elevations and we, we don't know what the 
extent of the flooding is in those areas based on, you know, the flood breach or the dam breach analysis. So it's, I think it's something like that. I don't think that we're going to take on the role of doing all the dam breach analyses for the dam owners, but we have to take the information provided by them and make a determination on whether it's a high significant or low hazard dam based on the definitions in part 315. Okay, just for the panel to be aware, other states are doing that. They are doing a very simplified flood inundation maps and uh, offering them to the dam owners with the disclosure that it's a very simplified one and they may adopt that one or not. Uh, example given is South Carolina. Yeah, but that's something we can consider assuming we had adequate staff <laughs> to do it. It's a, it's a big undertaking, you know, South Carolina got a whole bunch of staff because they had like 29 dam failures, you know, uh, what, six years ago or something like that. So, um, but anyway. I had uh, two, two questions. One is, um, do, does this group think that we want this um, ASDSO recommendation to include uh, defining consequences about uh, what, what happens if, they, if the dam owner does, does not do this? Or, or is consequences like just some umbrella captured somewhere else? Uh, um, because I think I, as I read this language, I think it's silent on, on that if they, if they don't provide this information. The reason why I even thought of this is because um, imagine yourself a dam owner and you have, you know, no input or no say, of course, in what goes on downstream. But here, you know, somebody is permitting all this development and it, uh, and it ultimately is going to end up as a, as a major financial consequence to the dam owner, um, you know, to perform all this additional effort uh, because someone else built something downstream. And, and he may not be financially in a position to, to do any of that, you know, no planning, no forecasting or anything. Um, this all recently came up in the city of Ann Arbor for us because a large development's going downstream of Argo, but because we're the dam owner and we're the permitting agency for the development, we know of all the coordination that needs to take place and we're requiring the developer to either fund those efforts or perform some of those efforts on behalf of the city, but the city is not inheriting the, the cost to, to, to do all of that. So this is beyond, this is maybe certainly beyond this line item of whether we're saying we're supportive of it or not or anything, but I mean, those were some real life consequences that we had to deal with specifically regarding this line item. Yeah, I'm, I, I, what? Sorry. Uh, well, Glenn, I'll just quickly, I agree with that 100%. Up here uh, in the UP, the Red Ridge Dam had a homeowner build a home in the 200-year floodplain. We all went from low risk to, high, to, to a higher risk. Yeah. Uh, is there, just a question, is, is there anything in these regulations that in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, have them, someone who moves into the, the floodplain of a dam, um, have any type of uh, review through this through these regulations? No, there's not. And that, so I think you guys have hit on a couple good points that didn't really come through in at least in this subgroup. But one is, you know, building code and ordinance aren't very well tied in with dam breach analysis. We have a pretty good, you know, understanding of building within the hundred year floodplain for the FEMA, you know, you know, flood insurance program, but we don't have anything that says you shall not build your house in a dam breach inundation area. And other states do. I think Wisconsin has basically banned construction in dam breach inundation areas. So similar to having a, you know, a, a, a firm, you know, from FEMA that shows the extents of the hundred year floodplain, they have a map that shows the extents of the, uh, uh, of the dam breach inundation areas and you're not allowed to build in there. 
you know, and so I think that's one way to kind of prevent hazard creep from happening. But the reality is that it is happening everywhere else that doesn't have local ordinance or state building code that says you can't do it. And, uh, and, and then, then you're right. It, it goes back on the dam owner who not only have, they have to provide an EAP, but the dam might not meet design standards. Now, you know, if you're, if the design standards are higher for a high hazard potential dam than a low, and they were just passing at low and now they don't. Right. And that happens. And, and, and it's, and, and there isn't good communication about it. We don't, we don't have anything in statute that says there has to be better communication about it. So it is something that, you know, one, you know, is something I would love to look at if I had, you know, a million extra hours laying around is get with the building, you know, the building code folks and say, let's start taking a look at building code around dam breach inundation areas in addition to floodplain areas. And the other one is how do we alert folks that they live downstream of a dam in, in an inundation area? You know, when, especially at FERC dams where a lot of that stuff is kept under lock and key, you know, it's like, you don't have access to the documents that tell you that you're in the inundation area. So one of those things would be, how do we get inundation maps out to the public in a meaningful way so that they know that they're at risk of a dam failure and what their response would be. But I don't, if you want to take it one step beyond that is, you know, uh, do, do dam potential. So the good news is we don't build a lot of dams anymore, but if we were other places in the nation are, you know, that might create a situation where there's already an existing development and now there's a dam upstream that puts that development in, in, in harm's way if it were to fail. So, and I don't know what level of input those folks have on whether or not a dam gets built upstream of them. So, but yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, we can, those are things that, but yeah, those are definitely two big topics that are, are at the forefront of our mind. And, you know, we, we think about a lot as well. Well, Luke, you know, I, I, I don't want to expand this into an infinite rabbit hole here, but I, I really do think that that first point you mentioned is, is very important, actually, is uh, we're not going to solve it here. But I think coming out of this committee, I would love to see a recommendation that that this um, that dam inundation zones need to be brought up onto the radar of building yeah, I because agree. that's driving us. That's, I mean, you can't, otherwise it just focuses it all on the dam owner and it, that's not right. I mean, it's, it's all this property development has to be in light of that. In addition to that FEMA map floodplain. So if we can send a recommendation out of it to that extent, I think would be a benefit. I agree on that. There's other sub teams for the for the legislation and authority and another one for compliance and enforcement that maybe there needs to be some cross pollination here so that they can be part of that. I don't think either one of those two things are in ASDSO's recommendations. Is that correct? So I think and Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, our goal is to make it through all the ASDSO recommendations, but also have the task force have any additional um, recommendations. So I think those might be to Elizabeth that you could document as things this committee would like to recommend to the bigger task force. Yes, Amy, definitely. I think um, that's right for this first meeting. And some of this is just going to be organic, right? As, as you're having the conversation, some uh, gaps are going to be identified, some recommendations that uh, aren't in front of us on these tables. Um, so I and the other facilitators, uh, Mark and John, are going to be capturing those new ones or where there are gaps identified. Um, and we'll compare notes um, across the subgroups. And uh, the idea is, or what we would be proposing is in our second subgroup discussions, um, spending more time um, in a more, um, structured way on what is the process for bringing in those new recommendations. But yeah, excellent. And I will just, if I can just add real quickly, um, Luke had mentioned about um, the need to have some kind of program that informs the public about uh, risks in flood inundation zones. And yeah, indeed there are you know a number of, of states that are doing that and they have programs uh, set up for that. So I'm sure those resources are uh, will be available to to Michigan. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I I guess uh, this is Dan. Just for my own edification, to kind of try and 
summarize this particular line item is it basically it sounds like what this one's asking for and I think what some of the initial comments were on this is that we're looking for um, you know some form of checklists and requirements including you know timelines deadlines for um, addressing hazard creep and I guess I'll I'll throw out that it probably would have two different avenues, one being owner-induced and another being community-induced hazard creep? I guess my one word I'd like to say is, or amend here, not to address hazard creep, but to assess hazard creep. You're asking the owner to assess it. The, the one who address the statute really already addresses it. It tells you what you have to do when it happens. It, when your when your you know rating increases and you move into these other categories of things you've got to do, it's already there. And and moreover, the the state again is the one that really addresses it by saying, "Hey, owner, your hazard creep is high enough. Now you are." this ranking, but I think assessing it really is what this seems to be talking about. I guess, so, I mean, we can assess it, but it, during the, I mean, we, we, we know we assess it during, um, you know, the inspections. We know that we, we assess it during, you know, engineering analyses for modifications, but and I guess the way they've got it written in the, the recommendation is addressing it. And probably the biggest question is, you know, what is the acceptable time frame for addressing it? You know, you mentioned you change hazard classification, you're no longer in compliance. What's the acceptable time frame to get into compliance? Well, but see, then that, all right, then that bumps us out, out of this rules section, I think, and into the to me, you're 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 in the statute that section 315, 517, for example, duties yeah. of the owner. Where now we're talking about your, you know, this is a this is what the owner's got to respond to, right? You have a change in hazard. This is your timeline. But I, I thought, you know, per Luke's original comments, we were really just talking about trying to bring this more to the attention of the inspector to say you need to really be looking at this assessing it yeah I, I would say maybe we stick a pin in it a little bit and hash out the details later but because i think we have some discretion right if it's as simple as developing an eap but the dam uh uh would meet high hazard potential you know design criteria then it's then the timeline could be relatively short but if it's something where you know the dam's going to require multi-million dollars of upgrades now to to come back into compliance because it went from a low to a high or something like that, you know, I think that that would be something where we'd have to be a little bit working with the owner to to implement in a time frame that makes sense, right? So I think that maybe we, you know, we address all those details later, but maybe think about that. How do we do that in a meaningful way? If it does, you know, if hazard creep results in a hazard increase and all, now the dam is out of compliance, I think we have the framework and the statute and rules on how to address compliance issues already. Um, but I guess we'd have to figure out, do we need something very specific to hazard creep or does our general compliance? And it's the same thing with, uh, with I think that uh, uh, Glenn asked a question earlier about, you know, what happens if they, they don't do this or whatever. We have the ability to enforce anybody that's out of compliance with any part, section or rule of 315 and then, you know, and we have the we have the framework to do that, regardless of what the non-compliance issue is. So, um, do, I guess the question would be: Does this issue of hazard creep and reassessment require its own, you know, kind of special enforcement or you know assessment and address and and uh, format for addressing? So, but yeah. That said, I don't. I hate to. I think we need to move on. <laughs> My point is, so we're we're on number two, and we don't have a whole lot of time left. Yep. I guess my question would be, how are we going to not be in the same spot at the next meeting on this recommendation? So, um, what does the subgroup need from Eagle or PSC to try to? 
I mean, maybe Elizabeth could send out the notes and somebody on the subgroup could massage the recommendation or do we think the recommendation is okay, but there's a whole bunch of things that the department's gonna have to think about when they try to implement that or? I guess, Amy, if I can reply to that, I, uh, I would really encourage the task force members for anyone who wants to, who feels uh, that they want to have a hand in crafting this to take the next step um, and present some language to this group uh, via email uh, for review, um, just to keep this moving forward. And to, and to be respectful of, um, of Eagle staff time. And then, you know, whatever support um, I can land or PSC, we could do that. But do we have any volunteers from the task force? I'll, I'll send something through on that. Okay. And just, you know, based on my my understanding of it, I may be off base, but anyway, let I'll, I'll take that, so. Thank you, Paul. Let's get out here. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and then moving on to this third recommendation in the permitting category. Um, so, and Luke or Amy or, or Dan, Mario, anyone who, um, anyone from Eagle who feels like uh, if there's anything that you wanna say about this. Um, the last time, I'll just add, the last time we discussed it on the 21st of October, um, this is one that the group felt needed some refinement and discussion. Um, there was some hesitation about operator permits um, and what's going to be needed to maintain uh, permits. Um, Glenn also shared his experience um, that in the city about operations and maintenance are treated separately from safety and security requirements. Um, so that's just a little bit to, to jog your memories. Sure. So I think this is kind of tying into a couple of themes that ASDSO, the, the, the peer review team was going on. And one was that um, other states use, uh, uh, you know, kind of annual fees or whatever, you know, for O&M of a dam uh, to help help fund the, the dam safety program to ensure that they can meet all the requirements, ensure that these dams are continually to be safe as it goes on. So, but also there's a... Uh, um, you know, this, this, this re-evaluation thing, you know, like for dams that are, have been constructed in the modern era where the dam safety program has had the uh, oversight over construction of dams, they've probably been fairly well vetted and fairly well reviewed when they were constructed. But a lot of dams predate that and have never been, you know, evaluated for adequacy in design, you know, other than just visual inspections and assessment of, you know, visual structural stability and hydraulic capacity to meet state requirements. So I think that's kind of the bigger theme here, but this is very specific to a uh, period for the dam construction permit that notes a time period for construction and also provides ongoing operation and maintenance of the dam. So I think that we have the first part of that pretty well defined. Uh, part 315 says we can only issue a permit for two years. We can extend that permit, you know, for up to two years at a time, you know, uh, if there's if there's cause so I think that you know and and we usually put conditions in the permit that say you know you can't do work during this time you can't do work during this time because of other environmental concerns or construction you know difficulty in winter or something like that with placing fill and things like that but uh you know again we don't I and we don't build a lot of new dams there's not a lot of construction going on but this isn't a bad you know um a bad thing to think about. I think the big takeaway from here is what, what if anything, do we need to do for ongoing um, permitting and review for operation and maintenance of dam to assess operational adequacy and maintenance adequacy of dams that exist because the state doesn't really have any authority to do that now. You know, whether that's through, you know, uh, annual fees where they submit a 
O&M plan and we review it for adequacy and then, you know, collect the fee or not collect the fee and do that same level of review, you know, for their O&M plans, you know, is it, is it satisfactory? Does it keep the dam in a safe condition or do they need to bump up those, those activities at the dam to ensure that it's safe? So that'd be, that'd be my takeaway from this is, is the ongoing O&M and how do we review that? Thanks, Luke. Are there any questions or discussion or is it possible that we'd be ready, you'd be ready to uh, adopt this as is? I just have to ask the question. Well, I guess I wonder why I, I, I am totally uh, hearing you, Luke, on this evaluation of like legacy dams, for example, that you don't have any real good analysis on. That, that is kind of a thorn that we have to address in some fashion. But does that need a permit? I mean, I, I guess, why can't that be addressed during the, um, you know, during the normal inspection cycle where you say, you know, somehow we're gonna get this basis, base of information on their legacy dam and then that just gets looked at during the inspection cycle. I guess I don't really see the need for an annual permit. I mean, it just seems like a way to collect a fee, which maybe if that's what we need to do, but um, what else is being done there? What else is implied with that permit? Um, so if you, don't, any, yeah. if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of interject because I, I do want to separate these trains of thoughts. We, we have a separate subcommittee that goes over that re that discusses the reevaluation. So let's kind of park that on the side. And I think this really is strictly just focused on looking at operation and maintenance. Do we want a permit specifically for operation and maintenance? You know, they've provided two alternatives for how we can achieve that in permitting. Um, the mechanism can be decided down the road, but it's just a question of, do we want an operation and maintenance permit for the dams? Um, personally, I guess I look at it, the things that we would be looking at would be you know, uh, any of the data that would be recorded annually from the dam, so uh, monitoring wells, piezometers, um, seepage weirs, uh, you know, any, any of that monitoring data that's, that, that's regularly and routinely being collected, and as well as, you know, gate operation information and, uh, um, you know, flow and water level data, uh, you know, just to, to, to verify that things are being operated according to what their their plan is and, and things are performing the way that are expected. Um, you know, on some of our high hazard dams, we do receive this periodically, you know, particularly I would think, uh, or what comes to mind is some of our tailings facilities where we get annual reports uh, on um, uh, monitoring data and construction data. Um, so I, I, I guess personally, that's what I had kind of perceived this as is really uh, looking at those annual operations and making sure that we're getting that information. And then from that, uh, or with that, we'll say, like Luke indicated, it provides us a funding source through fees. Yep. Yep. So, so Dan, are, are, we, are we talking about all dams or just high risk dams? I think that's a good point of discussion for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, realistically, uh, these small dams that people have, little over five acres, little over six foot in height. Uh, they've never measured a ounce of water going through them. Uh, they do not make any measurements. I, we can't be talking about those type of dams with this type of what you just said. So let me piggyback what Dan said and, and maybe kind of address what you're saying. I see this as the same as we did with the kind of the design calculations. It's kind of commensurate to the complexity and risk level of the dam, right? If it's just a small low head dam with no moving parts, O&M is nothing, you know, it's it's mowing and, and taking the beaver debris out and trapping the muskrats, you know, and filling in depressions. But but we, we, we currently have no teeth in the statute to require any O&M plans to be developed, you know, and or maintained or reviewed. So I think that's kind of the underlying thing here is that we, we don't, we can't require, I mean, we, we probably could under a broad authority to require additional studies and analyses, but we don't have anything that specifically addresses the, the dam should, the dam owner should even develop and keep up to date an operations and maintenance plan for a dam. And I think that, you know, for, for very simple dams, it could be a very simple plan for very complex dams. It can be a very complex plan. 
But the thought here is too, is it should be up to date. It should have contact information in it. And it should have like, you know, the part of the secession plan, right? If if dams have an operator staff or O&M staff where like with the municipalities with, with, with the city of Ann Arbor or something, they have staff that go out and mow and just gates and things like that. And those people retire, you know, and, and they might have it all in their head what they do at the dams, but it'd be nice if we got that out on paper and that so that the next guy who is training could have that available to them as well. So I think there's a lot, you know, there's lots of pieces parts. We go a lot of different directions, but I think the, the main focus here is that, and then doing what Dan said, separating it out from the reevaluations, it'd be good if we would put some thought into should the state have teeth to require that dam owners have an O and M plan that's commensurate with the with with their dam, right? That's you know the the complexity and risk level of their dam, and keep it up to date and provide that information to the the dam safety program for review. Whether we need to collect a fee to get you know to generate some funds to do some of the stuff that we want to do, or whether we don't need to do that, whether it can be part of the uh, you know triannual or three four or five year inspection process if that's not frequent enough could should we require it annually you know some things like that i think that would be the what we'd be looking for as far as recommendations out of this group is you know do we need to put it into statute or rule how frequently should it happen and how, how best to do that so um or is this you know this language good enough so well what the question here is not whether to have an o and m manual it seems like it's it's to have a permit. I mean, doesn't I mean the the the, the safety reports already have a section on O and M, and I, I I think that might be a little better developed. But um, I guess that's what I'm getting at is why can't this stuff be included in the regular inspection reports um, as opposed to making a new round of documentation that's kind of separate from it. Um, whatever it be would be, and I think yeah, you're probably right, Luke. Uh, better O and M requirements probably is, is a good idea, um, but uh, couldn't that just be in the normal safety inspection reports that that information shows up? I I, I think in addition to it, it's also why by it being under a permit um, provides kind of like Luke says additional you know, regulatory teeth, because now, you know, you'd be violating a permit if you weren't, you know, properly maintaining it, properly operating the dam uh, versus us, you know, having to go through, you know, other avenues and requesting analyses or whatever else, you know, in order to try and uh, effectuate a, a, a change. Whereas if it's an operation, you know, you get a permit where you've submitted an operation and maintenance plan we now have the ability to say you're not meeting your permit because you aren't following the operate the accepted operation and maintenance plan. Well, well, Dan, I mean, if, if, if you go to a dam and you see the spillway is clogged, the, the beavers plugged it up, um, you have means to to go after the, the owner, don't you? Yeah, we have the you means cite to cite the after owner them. for today. I mean, you could cite them and give them a monetary uh, 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 bill or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused on that point. Um, no, I, oh. Go ahead. Sorry, I guess um, I just want to bring us back to um, the the sheet um, and again, the, the timing on this. So the task force, um, it sounds like there needs to be uh, some additional discussion um, probably offline again you know is there uh, a task force member who is interested in um, moving this forward in between this meeting and the next one again you know I'm happy to support um, but want to keep us focused on on moving forward we do have a couple of recommendations from the ASDSO here um, but there's clearly some, some questions about uh, how to enact this and, and what the task force wants to recommend. Are we necessarily gonna get a consensus on all these items? Or are we gonna maybe just 
share our diverse thoughts. I, I guess you tell me. I don't. I don't know. Well, certainly that's. I mean, one of the in the report that will go to the legislature and and to the director and governor after this task force is done, there can be a place or there will be a place for any um, uh, contrary or different thoughts uh, apart from the task force recommendations. So that can be included. Um, I would just suggest that if somebody has an idea, they wanna dig into this, maybe see what other states are doing and, and we can help guide that research and then just put something forth for discussion maybe that's a good approach. And if we can't get to consensus, 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 we would not get to consensus and we'd have maybe uh, differing opinions. So, but I think, you know, maybe the first step is to get somebody to put something forward, you know, like what, if we don't love the ASDSO language, which it sounds like we're, we don't necessarily love the ASDSO language, what else makes sense here? And let's, let's, you know, talk about it, right? Okay, well, I, I can, step up and, and try to rewrite this. So Paul, you're, you're, you also have a concern. You want to work with me on this and come up with a different or set of or an alternate thought process here? Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. Okay. Just for the counterpoint, I'd be happy to work with you too, because I, I do see a need for this. And, and Stan, we can talk offline about it, especially for some of the smaller dams, because they kind of fly under the radar until an issue happens. I've seen that person work with Luke on one. So I'd be happy to work with the two of you, you know, kind of in a, maybe a diverse perspective. Okay, well, I'll take your, I'll, I'll get your emails and uh, contact you after then. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else want to participate on that? I, okay. I'd be happy to do that too, Stan. Okay. Good. I've got uh, me, Paul, Marty, and Brad. D D uh, Dan, you Thanks. or Luke want to be participate on that, or I certainly keep us, you know, uh, in the loop, copied on emails and stuff, and we can. We'll, we're certainly okay, available. I'll, to see, help I'll, CC, you I'll CC both of you then. Yeah. So, kind of as a general rule, we're not trying to influence the direction of the task force, right? At all. This is an independent process. You guys can, but. but Certainly, if you want to consult with us and ask questions and get our thoughts, we're, we're happy to provide that. But like I said, we kind of we're hoping the recommendations would be a, you know, not just a uh, eagle tells the task force what we think should be done type of thing, right? So, <laughs> no, no, but we need we need your perspective. Ab absolutely, we're absolutely we available to provide pr perspective. Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we are at, I have 1018, we're going until 1030. Um, how, uh, I'd like to suggest maybe we, we start taking a look at this design review, this first one, just to get the conversation going. Um, I think it's pretty clear we're gonna need the second subgroup conversation. Um, so before we conclude, I'll just double check that, that date with everybody um, and identify our next steps. But um, this is uh, now moving into design review. The uh, Eagle staff had looked at this recommendation from ASDSO and um, were recommending adoption by the task force uh, based on their review. Um, you know, the last time that this group discussed this recommendation on October 21st, uh, the main feelings were that this is a common practice for agencies and it's critically important uh, that this uh, be happening in Michigan going forward. So it didn't seem like there was uh, much controversy over this, you know, recommendation uh, that there, that the agency has the uh, option to periodically award engineering services contracts to qualified consulting firms to augment existing agency staff when needed. This seemed like a standard practice to me and I'm, I'm supportive. Very supportive. Yeah, I agree. 
Okay, it sounds like comfortable with uh, adopting this. Okay, great. Uh, well, in that case, let me push our luck and just go to this next one here. Uh, the related to our requiring a requirement for the owner of proposed complex projects to provide an independent board of review to affirm the owner's design. Uh, Eagle staff indicated this would be a real change um, for, for 1302. Uh, now I will note that the last time we talked about it, uh, the group had a number of questions about what this would look like and some concern about this being potentially an extremely expensive uh, proposition for individual dam owners, um, I guess, depending on how it's, how it goes forward. Hey, Elizabeth, can I say one thing really quick? And I don't want to eat up any time. It's like, you know, this, I think where, where, where you're coming from in these, a lot of these uh, recommendations are, you know, that AM safety programs at the state level typically aren't well funded enough to have all the in-house expertise or be able to hire it out, you know, uh, for, for the previous uh, recommendation where you have a very, very complex design. So I think this was kind of an alternative, and this is a lot what FERC does, you know, is they push that responsibility back to the dam owner, which says, you know, one engineer isn't an expert in all areas of dam safety engineering. It takes a comprehensive team. So if they have, and, and sometimes they say they introduce this independent language as, as a kind of a safeguard against owners that hire certain engineers that might cut corners or, you know, put, put together a, a, you know, package that, you know, they're not qualified to do. So there's an independent review. So I think this one, just keep in mind that this is kind of an alter, I, I see this as an either or, either, either the dam safety program has the adequate staffing and funding levels to be able to do this in-house and contract with an independent consultant to lend that expertise, or as an alternative, we could push that, that responsibility back to the owner and have them provide an independent review team so that we can, you know, have a little that heavy lifting done for us. So I, I just, that's all I had to say. Luke, would this apply to um, new dams and rehabilitation as well? I think it's wherever the, 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 uh, the, co the design is so complex that it's, you know, outside of our ability to review, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, very complex, you know, new constructions are complex, complete rehabilitation or reconstruction is complex at times if it's not a six foot high dam, you know, so this would be, you're thinking larger, more complex dams on larger, more complex projects is be kind of a reserve for those type of things, but it'd be commensurate with the risk level and with the comp complexity. Uh, so uh, Luke, just a quick question then. Uh, I mean, in the mining industry, they will hire a, a firm to do a design of a tailing dam. Uh, say it's complex, say it sits next to Lake Superior. Um, so you have a, a reputable, qualified, high-tech company do it. So would you also consider them having to hire another company to review the first company? Is that fall in this type of thought process? That's typically the way that FERC has done it for hydropower dams is the, the owner has what they called a dam owners, uh, like, uh, I forget, it's, but they have their own, their engineers, right? They're, they're that, that produce the design. And then, you know, if there needs to be an independent review of that design, it would be by somebody separate who doesn't work for the owner. You know, it's, it's that thing about, you know, is, you know, is the owner's consultant truly independent, you know, pr putting forth. And I, like I said, you know, I don't, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other, but I think that's what the intent here is to separate, you know, the, uh, the owner's consultant and then have an independent review, whereas the state could provide that independent review if they had the resources or a, a separate entity could be hired to do that independent review. Okay. So just, most companies have liability insurance and they have a review process that's external to their company. That, that probably is not what you're talking about then. That's not what ASDSO is talking about here. No, they're talking about a fully independent team looking at somebody else's design and either concurring or, or uh, raising concerns with that design. 
Um, once again, I think that's fairly standard. I worked on projects that have done, done that a lot on complex and large projects. I, I guess one of the, the pieces I'm looking at, if a complex project was um, being designed, it could cripple, really it could cripple the dam safety program, it, depending on the complexity, because you'd have the hundreds of hours that would be spent and all the technical expertise removed. So Luke, I would assume that that was some of the purpose of this. So if, and th these would come in bursts or you, you might not have one for a couple of years, right? And then all of a sudden one's put on your desk and I could see it crippling, I think is the word I would use in your, your program. I, I would say that historically, yeah, we don't typically always have one of these in, but Recently, we've had at least one or two or three ongoing all the times. I'm, I'm thinking Grand Rapids and Flynn and, you know, Boardman and, you know, and those all came in in the last few years. And those are very, very complex, you know, designs that have super multifaceted, you know, something that Dan or I couldn't handle on our own that we have to have additional resources for, you know, and whether we can do that in-house with some expertise we have in-house, whether we could contract that out to a consultant, to, you know, to fill that role or whether the owner has to fund an independent review as well. You know, that's that's to be determined for discussion for this group, I guess. I would think it should be tied to hazard potential as well. Yep. You know. yep. And, and do we want, I guess it says provide, do we really want it to say fund? I mean, one of the things, we're, we're, the, the previous recommendation is looking at, um, you know, us having consultants under contract. You know, is, it, is this really more a question of our, uh, review fee, you know, or the permit fee? Personally, I'd agree with that because I wouldn't want the owner to provide the independent review. There should be some separation for conflict of interest and tie it back to the, the recommendation before um, to have staff from Eagle or, or an extension of Eagle staff to be able to do that. If you hire an independent company, they are going to be fairly adversarial against the one company designing it. So even if they're paid by the same person, um, they're going to be quite happy to find problems with the other company's design. <laughs> so sorry to interject, but given the, the time, I'm going to suggest a, a end to the, the conversation uh, for this meeting. Um, let me just ask a quick question though, regarding this, this particular one, if it was a word change, uh, of instead of to provide, it was to fund, is that something that the subgroup is ready to say we're comfortable with that? We'd recommend it or I guess maybe thumbs up if yes, but if not, then we'll, we'll put this one on the side. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we are going to have another discussion uh, coming up. So let's let's put a, a pin in this one for now. Um, in terms of next steps, and, and first of all, thanks again um, for everybody being here today and for all of the work that uh, Eagle staff put in to preparing this information for this conversation. Um, so next steps, um, some of you have uh, taken on the task of doing some language revision uh, on a couple of recommendations. Uh, I'd be happy to follow up via email, just as a reminder for what those are. Um, so Paul offered to work on this uh, 22090-B, and then Stan, Paul, Brad, and Marty um, are going to uh, uh, work on the, the next recommendation under that C. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And we will be... First of all, are there any other uh, action items that I've left out? Those were the two that I had on my list. Okay. And in terms of when the permitting and design group is going to be meeting again, we will reconvene as a group on Monday, November 23rd at 11 a.m. Again, I'll send out uh, meeting materials ahead of time to you. Um, but given that uh, we won't be meeting until the 23rd, that means that these proposed language revisions, um, that should give a good amount of time for you to get together and then send an update to, to the group. Um, that would give all of next week. 
Elizabeth, um, if I come up, we come up with some language in these separate groups. Do you want us to send that to you and you pass it around? Or how do you want to work that or just pass it around to the group from ourselves? You know, I think maybe uh, I would recommend that you send it to me and then I can um, make sure that we get it to all of the people uh, yeah. in the conversation. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Um, well, it's 1030. Uh, are there any parting words? All set. Okay. Thank you. Have a good rest Thank of the you. day. Thank you.